thank you first of all for doing this it's a difficult time for all of us i guess i guess uh, how are you coping right now um, being indoors and um yeah fine um there's really nothing you can do other than try and follow the the rules the government have set over here um to protect everyone's safety so um yes it's not ideal um i'm sure you know everyone would love to be out and about especially the weather's nice now um you know and hopefully this is a time now where you know a lot of cricketers you know is that expectation of season underway you know all the pre-season prep now would be sort of coming to coming to an end and the game you know you're starting to get outside and preparing but it's just a very unfortunate um situation we find ourselves in globally um but you know all we can do as a as a as a society as a public is to uh help where we can and that's really just by following the rules and and trying to keep you know keep indoors and keep away from sort of social gatherings yeah um so let's start with your artwork um how did you get into this and when did you do, start to do it professionally um well i think it sort of started from school um i, I was always quite keen on on drawing from a small child um and then at, at school uh, obviously where you you learn about art and stuff like that as one of your subjects so i was always uh, quite keen on on sort of drawing um and that kind of stuff um and then obviously went away from it for quite a few years to pursue obviously cricket professional cricket um and it was really just through uh, injury in uh, 2016 i think it was um where something prompted me to sort of come back to sketching um again um just i suppose really just secure boredom and and going off the rails much similar to now <laughs> and um yeah and and it's just but i suppose the 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 difference being when i took it up in 2016 again it was you know it was social media was you know was something that when you put your drawings out there the love and support i received from doing it was was just beyond my wildest dreams really so um of the I, i suppose the obvious starting point for me was to start to draw cricketers because that was my my world for a long time um and as i said it just grew and grew from there um and i'm it's still something i actively do now all right so let's talk about your cricketing journey early can you tell us how did you get into cricket and your early part of your cricketing journey yeah um started very early um i was very lucky even both my parents um stem from the caribbean so they they both had a deep love for cricket um so it was one of those things my dad my dad was a keen club cricketer um and we used to go along and watch as a family um when i was quite small so the the guys my dad played with saw some early talent with me there um he used to be throwing balls at me at, as early as age 2 and 3 Okay. Um, I went that and if not I was at home uh sort of throwing balls against the cupboards um and sort of emulating my favorite players at the time which was been like Gordon Greenwich and Viv Richards, Brian Lara's, um Ricky Pontins, um you know those kind of guys. Um and then I suppose really was about age 9 where I was spotted um at a, at a holiday camp for kids um where I was invited to come along. Uh, by Surrey County Cricket Club um to come and join their under 11s program and it's something that I obviously stayed with until I turned pro in uh, 1998 and I joined the professional staff and um yeah it was I say the journey really began then um you know going from sure. being a very good youth player to now you're in the big what bad wild world of uh, professional cricket so um opening in england is probably the most difficult uh, job in, in in cricket uh were you an opener from the very beginning or did, did somebody advise you to change it to in your early early career like, uh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah i was i was i think i was quite a rare specimen really i think from from my early recollections um as early as probably about 12 or 13 i i found myself up the order <laughs> um okay you know, opening the batting um i think in back in those days 
uh, I, I think when I started with Surrey, I was I was initially sort of middle order, lower order, um, and then when we started playing the quick guys, the certain kids that didn't like quick bowling, whereas I was always exposed to it from my dad from quite an early age. So so I guess I, I showed some promise and made the spot my own really. So um, and and it was a, a position I enjoyed even through my whole my whole life, my whole career it was. Yeah, you're right. It's challenging, especially playing in, growing up in English conditions, especially this time of year. You know, you're playing a lot of green green pitches, overcast skies, um, ball swinging around, ball nipping around. It's it's never it's never an easy task or an easy job, but it's it can be quite a rewarding job if if it's done well. Um, I still see it as you know one of the purest forms of batting going around. You know, the the contest between great new ball bowler versus you know the skills, the technique, the temperament, the patience of, of an opening batsman. Yeah. Um, so um, Shane Warne had an early influence in your career. I was reading about it. Um, can you talk us a little bit? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, Shane Warne had a massive, massive impact in my career. Um, I was a probably a young kid, a um, bit lost in county cricket. In my previous two clubs. Uh, Surrey and Kent, uh, where opportunities were hard to come by. Um, two great teams stacked with a lot of experience. So as a young kid coming in, it was, I suppose, quite hard to, to cement a place in those two respective teams. So I came to Hampshire really as a, I suppose, the last throw of the dice. I was 24, 25 years old, I can't remember. Um, and really, I suppose what I needed was backing. And Warney was, you know, the best captain I ever played under in terms of, you know, he, he had that rare quality of a, being able to get five or ten percent more out of the average human. Um, he, he himself obviously was, a, you know, a great, a legend, a magician, you know, all those words. Um, but the thing with Warney and, you know, sadly, it's, it's the things that are not talked about enough when, when talking about Shane Warne is, is how generous he was as a, as a as a man as a captain you know the amount of time i spent with him talking about the game learning the game from him um without doubt you know i would not have played international cricket if it wasn't for him and his presence in the dressing room or that period of two years where i joined hampshire because i think he got me understanding the mindset of what it took to be an international player versus just being a a run of the mill county player um and he was able to harness i suppose that raw talent that i did have um and combine it with a little bit more mental steel uh, which was required at the to get to the highest level how was it facing him in the nets <laughs> you tell me <laughs> he didn't bother <laughs> <up> in the nets <laughs> okay all right, all right. No, he didn't tend, he didn't tend to sadly i i didn't i, I faced him I think probably twice in two years. Um, oh, okay. he, he didn't. He didn't tend to bowl very much in the nets. He was. I think he, by that stage, you know, rightly so, he bowled. Oh goodness knows how many. He was tens of yeah. yeah, I mean, he bowled tens of thousands of overs in in international cricket and and first class cricket. And yeah, I mean, it was more about him being ready for the game. So you you know you're more likely to see Warney with the physio getting you know um, work on his shoulder and fingers and just making sure he was loose, ready for the games. He, he didn't tend to uh, send too many down in the nets. Um, but as I said, he was, to be honest, not, not not facing him, you know, but he was still around at training. So yeah. I mean, it was still a great opportunity to for someone like me to tap into what he looks for when he's bowling to, you know, the great players like Brian Lara, you know, what, what left hand, what he found difficult being a left-hander mm. myself, you know, Brian was probably, you know, in his own words, he said was one of the best players he ever bowled to. And, I, you know, I'd get to ask him, and Brian was obviously a, a hero of mine. And I said, well, what kind of stuff did he do that made you feel uncomfortable, knocked you off length and that kind of stuff? So even though he didn't physically bowl at me that often, I mean, just having, you know, having the opportunity to have those chats with him around training, to be honest, was better than any net you could ever have. Um, and yeah, as I said, I can't thank him enough. Uh, you know, I think I've been quite vocal about that when I when I 
in my own career of you know what he did for me in terms of, of my career and how you know how it got me to 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 the levels that I I always dreamt about so for in, for international audience your uh, the you came into recognition during that ashes famous ashes series where mitchell johnson was brutal uh, uh, how was how big was jump from county cricket to going into that environment uh, facing my, you know those kind of bowlers uh oh yeah it was it was uh Oh, it was amazing, amazing experience. Um, I mean, the result wasn't amazing, but um, <laughs> but yeah, look, I, I think having spent, I think it was close to thirteen or fourteen years grinding away in county cricket um, to to firstly get the opportunity to walk out there to represent my country in the Ashes was was a fantastic um, achievement on my behalf. You know, through all the problems I've had personally off the field and 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 those kind of things to to you know a 34 to to finally get the opportunity to to play um four years after my initial test debut um you know i i, I never thought i'd play again to be honest um i thought i would always be a one test wonder uh it wasn't through a lack of runs or trying in county cricket i mean if you look at my record post my my um test debut in 2010 against bangladesh you know, you'll find that I'm still up there in one of the top run scorers in, in, in this country domestically. But I was always behind two great openers in Cook and Strauss. And I suppose, and I was similar age to, to Strauss. So I guess I had to wait for a space to be freed up at the top. Um, so it was it was a frustrating time, but I guess it was reward for perseverance um, and not giving up and always believing that my chance will come again. And um, yeah, look, I, I think I've always been the kind of player I always want my opponent to be at his very best because it gives me a very good indication of where my game was and and whether I've got the ability to combat them. So the fact that Mitchell um, Johnson was probably, it was, the, you know, he was at the height of his powers in that series. Um, he, he completely steamrolled not only us but South Africa I think followed soon after that series mm. uh, where he, he you know he had a, a, a great series there as well but I think for me it was it, it's like no other challenge um, you'd ever face in, in the county game um, that was the noticeable thing I mean yeah people talked about the pace that he bowled at you know he was regularly over 150 155 most of the time which let me tell you is it suddenly doesn't become a test of technique. It's more a test of ticker. Yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, the thing for me is I, I the, the one thing that I can take away from that series looking back is, I mean, yeah, look, I didn't, I would never lay claim to say that I, I destroyed Mitchell Johnson in that series or, yeah. you, you know, I, ne I can never say that. I mean, we were comprehensively beaten, but, the preparation that I did leading into that series, I think, gave me more of a chance compared to some of the other batters in our team who really struggled in that series because I wasn't probably so overawed by the pace. Um, it's something I trained for. As like I said, I've been a county pro for 13 or 14 years at that stage, so I knew my game very well. I was 34 years old, I think, at the time. So um, I knew that, you know, this guy's going to come hard. Um, I'm a newbie in terms of test cricket, so I still have a lot to prove, um, although I have a very good first-class record. So the weeks leading into the series, you know, you'd find me somewhere in an indoor school, um, you know, facing high pace. And, you know, I took a lot of blows. I took a lot of hits in the nets. Uh, but it was all, all in preparation for that for that series and making sure that I give myself the best chance to to try and succeed. And I suppose it played out as it's supposed to, really. Um, he bowled, as I said, he bowled, he was the best bowl, fast bowler in the world, <laughs> undoubtedly. Yeah. And we were a batting unit that were short on confidence, short on form, short of runs. I don't, I can't speak for other people's preparation. I can only speak for my own, but um it gave me a chance to to combat him, and I think the, I think uh, someone sent me the stats 
soon after the series that I think I faced the most balls from Mitchell Johnson yeah. in the series. And he only got me out twice in the series. So I could say, yeah, a tick in the box that it shows me that preparation is key. Um, you can never really take your eye off the ball in this game, um, which for some guys who played a lot more than me at that time, um, maybe underestimated how well Mitchell came back from, from his own troubles. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the series. I enjoyed the, the, the hype. I mean, it, it's the media spotlight that was that the thing that stuck out for me the most, that everything was under the microscope a lot more different to county cricket. Um, your mistakes are highlighted so much more. Uh, your technique is pulled apart. Um, and it's it's very, I think it's, it's very, more, I think it's more, it's more of a challenge, yeah, a challenge, mental, yeah. it's more of a challenge, your mental, challenge your mental ability ability at that level. At that level. Um, you've talked about that you, you got a lot more praise from the Australian camp uh, rather than uh, the English camp. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was, yeah. Um, once once the series had finished, I, obviously I went back to Australia to play a couple of seasons of big bash cricket, and yeah. I I actually felt my efforts were more applauded in Australia than they were in England. Um, coincidentally, after that series, I never played another Test match again, and played yeah. very little international cricket after that. Um, yet I had the best statistics of that tour, so. Yeah. And going back to Australia for, for, you know, for that for those two years, I mean, every, all people wanted to talk about was me. What was it like facing Mitch Johnson? And I think actually, uh, Mitch, who did play for the Scorchers, uh, we we managed to catch up because I've actually known Mitch for a long time. We we go back as long as under 19s cricket. And um, still, was, still was, he didn't give you any any you know he he wasn't he didn't give you any leeway still during that series. I am in the nets. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but you know, I, look, I, I was, I was, as ha I was happy for him. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's always been a great guy, um, and I know he had his his struggles as well through through periods of his international career. So, but look, that's that's the game. You know, you, you you're going to come up against your friends at times, and um, yeah. you know, guys that you've grown up with. Michael Clark would be as another one who. You know, someone that I played under 19 cricket against, and it was great to see how these guys have developed since that time. So, we're all together now, we're playing in an Ashes series, and um, you know, for me, it was it was it was great, it was fantastic to play Mitchell at his very, very best because it gave me, I knew I came back from that tour full of confidence, knowing that you know. I could, I can, I can do this. You know, I, I can play. Um, it just needed maybe, I don't know, another, another couple of test matches to just really get my feet under the table. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't to be. I was, I suppose, one of the scapegoats for the tour, and it was, it was sad from that point of view. But I know that I, when I, wherever I go, particularly in Australia, um, I can obviously walk around with my hair, head up high. Um, just in the way that the Australian the Australian public responded to how I batted in that in that in that series and and even some of the players um, you know we had drinks after the series and you know a lot of them were very very complimentary in the way that I stood up to their bowling attack I mean remember there was Ryan Harris at the other end as well who wasn't slow you know I think people forget him you know he was he was a fantastic performer in that series yeah. as well um, along with Peter Siddle. Um, and Shane Watson and Nathan Lyons. So it wasn't just Mitchell Johnson, but the, I think yeah. they what the, what those guys saw was someone that wasn't prepared to lie down, um, was prepared to to go through it, do it the tough way, and you know that's what the game's about at the end of the day. So it's about that respect. Um, looking back after that series, a little while later, you were you were quite vocal about the management of Ashley Giles and and how we, you were treated. Uh, do you yeah. think that those, those statements kind of damaged your chances or it had already been decided? Uh, well, possibly, but um, yeah, it might, it might well have done. But I look, I, I think I'm only sp I'm speaking from a place of knowledge and facts. And 
I, I, at 34 years old, yeah, you need some clarity as to where your career is going. You know, I don't have the advantage of being 19 or 20 where there's a second and third coming for me. Um, and um, look, if at the end of the day it was held against me, then fine. Um, it's something I can live with. My conscience is certainly clear. Um, I wasn't given proper explanations. I had to, I had to be vocal and almost bang the cupboards to get an explanation, which I don't think personally is is a good form of management. Um, I think, as, as I said to Ashley over the phone, I said to James Whitaker over the phone, who were the selectors at the time, is that it's one thing when players get selected. You know, you can happily pick up the phone then, but it's just as important or probably, probably more important when you're dropping a player to do the same thing. Uh, that you shouldn't, the player shouldn't be left wondering what's going on. And, and that's exactly the situation I, I, was, I was left in after that series, as you rightly said, you know, after not having a bad series. You know, if you look at, the, you look at respecting numbers, of the batters, the English batters coming out of that series, you know, I was top of the tree or second top to KP, I think it was. And yet both of us were given the, given the boot. <laughs> so, you know, so look, at the end of the day, I, I can, I can, I'm very more than happy with the bloke who looks back at me in my bathroom mirror every day because I will always speak my mind, come what may. And if that means losing my international place, then so be it. Um, cricket doesn't define who I am. And still are kind of struggling to get their consistent openers. Yeah. So, um, what do you recall of Kevin Peterson? There's a lot of, obviously, uh, you were very much part of the dressing room. How do you recall uh, the dropping of Kevin Peterson? How did you feel uh, about that? And you were obviously part of the dressing room. So, how did you see it? Um. Well, look, I'll, I'll stick to the I'll stick to the passage of play that where I was there, right? Because. Okay. According to the ECB, they, they, on their dossier that they were keeping on KP, um, this was something that went years before me. So I wasn't I wasn't in the dressing room on that tour. Um, look, first, of all, let me let me stretch you. First of all, I've known Kevin Peterson a very very long time, right? And we've become good mates. Yeah, look, sure, we don't see each other at Christmas and birthdays, but that's due to schedules and and whatnot. Um, but he. He he's become a good mate. We we were teammates at Hampshire. Um, we played together at England, and I, you know, as 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 again, you talk about one of the players you look up to. You know, KP would definitely be one of those. Um, he's someone I've gone to for advice over time as well. So, you know, I'm I'm certainly not going to go out on a limb and say that KP was disruptive to me uh, or to the team in any shape or form. Kevin always made himself available to, to chat, chat the game. You know, I've even hung out with him in Australia. You know, he was he was always a very nice individual towards me. He was always complimentary towards how I played. Um, and he'd be honest with me if I didn't play well. And that's, and I'm very similar. And, and to be honest, different to, maybe different to a lot of people who can't handle, handle the honesty I can. Um, on that tour, I didn't see anything that led me to believe that, look, KP is just being a nuisance in the dressing room. Um, the things that were held against him, I don't believe are valid reasons. I mean, looking at your phone or your watch was one of the things that, or a couple of things that came out. I mean, who doesn't look at their watch or phone in a general meeting anyway? Um, and the fact that you're keeping a dossier on someone um, over a period of time as opposed to having that man-to-man -man conversation. So it stems back to the same things we're talking about with Ashley Giles and, and the management. You know, having that man-to-man -man conversation as opposed to keeping a dossier on someone's behaviour, I don't believe is the right way. I think sometimes it's better just having it out in the open. The, English, the England management having their say, KP having their say, and sometimes, look, you've got to de agree to disagree or you just agree that, look, this isn't working and you do what's necessary on both sides. Um, I think personally what I'm getting at is that I just think the, the whole thing was poorly handled. Um, my name was also thrown in that dossier, apparently, for some um, <laughs> altercation that we're supposed to have had in, in Melbourne. 
um, which me and Katie have laughed about it because we've never had an altercation in, in the 20 years we've known each other. So it was news to both of us. And the ECB to this day have never contacted me in regards to this altercation or that they were even putting it out on the news. Um, so again, how much credibility does this headline have? I don't know. And funny enough, the only person to contact me about it is KP saying that, look, I know what you've read, bruv, but <laughs> as you know me, look, I will always tell you what I've got to say to your face and, and that's it. And I said, well, it's news to me, mate, because what I can recall, I was out there dodging bounces from Mitchell Johnston for most of that <laughs> test match. So I'm trying to save the test match. So I don't I don't remember having the time to have an altercation with you, mate. So we, we, we basically just had a chat over it over, over about an hour. And we just couldn't understand where this is coming. But we, you know, look, I just wasn't prepared to sling mud with ECB, is what I'm saying. Uh, so you you played just before Ian Morgan took over and completely changed uh, England cricket. How do you see his captaincy and how he's taken the team forward? Say that again. I think you played just before Ian Morgan took over as captain. Uh, how do you see his captaincy and how he has changed uh, English cricket, especially white ball English? Yeah, um, well, I actually, I actually played under Morgs, um, only only six games. Yeah, I think look, I think yeah. Morgs' is captaincy, uh, I suppose, much like his, his batting, has is, is just gone to another level. Um, but I, I also think that you know it's it's allowing people to do the roles that they do in county cricket week on week. Um, you know, I for one was someone who played aggressively in, in white ball cricket. At Hampshire, we won a lot of trophies in that period of time. Um, but the, th the, the thinking when we were playing one day cricket back then, before, um, before the, obviously England went on their winning, winning streak, was we were playing a, a very outdated way of playing one day cricket. If you look around the world, you know, India, Pakistan, Australia, you know, South Africa, were all playing aggressive forms of cricket. You know, they had guys at the top of the order who it was almost like an elongated 2020 game. Um, yeah. You know, so we were massively behind in the way that we were playing the game. You know, we, yeah, we had two great batters at the top being Cook and Bell, but there weren't players that you would, you would say compared to say Warner and Finch or, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, guys of that ilk who are, you know, destroying yeah. attacks around the world. Um, you know, say Wags and, and Tendulkers, these kind of guys, you know, you, you're not, you're not putting those two guys in that bracket in terms of that format of the game. Um, so I think again, it was just bad timing on my part, part that I came in the, in, in the England setup at a time where we were a bit of a rudderless ship. Um, and unfortunately, I was never really able to sort of display what I could do before I found myself out of the team. Uh, but yeah, looking forward, I was really pleased um, of what I saw because, you know, the fact that we've, we've picked, you know, we identified Jason Roy, we saw Alex Hales, we've seen all these Johnny Bairstows, all these young guys coming through. And more importantly, as I've said to the selectors, you've got to stick with people, right? Um, why England won that World Cup last summer was simply because I mean, they've kept, you've kept faith in Owen I mean, Morgan as a captain. I think he's a fantastic captain and, and a fantastic bloke. Um, but also you've kept faith in a group of players for four years, right? Give or take one or two, right? Mm -hmm. But so that's a very powerful thing. Um, to know that as a, as a squad, you look around everybody in your team and you know you've got four years worth of international experience. That can't be bought, you know. You can't, you can't fast track that. Um, that's a team that was ready. It was primed. You know, it's been, it played in all conditions. It, 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 it found its brand of cricket and it was ready to go. It was, re it was just, in that, for me, it was inevitable winning that World Cup. I, I couldn't see anyone toppling us unless say we got to say the knockout stages and you know maybe it was a dusty turner and you know maybe we, we came across yeah. let's say an India or, or a Sri Lanka if they were still in the tournament where with their mystery spin that we might may have come on stuff but 
for me it was un, it was inevitable because we just had the right fit in all the right areas. We had you know great opening pair, great number three route coming in at four to balance things out. Captain coming in, you know that engine room at the back, Butler at the back end. You know we got great spinners in Rashid. Um, obviously the ad, advent of Jofra Archer giving us that cutting edge in pace experience Liam Plunkett Ben Stokes best all-rounder in the world you know is a three-in-one cricketer um yeah. so you, you look at that team and you think there isn't there just isn't a week and then you think of the guys on the bench who couldn't get a game you know there's no weak link uh, you just mentioned Alex Hales um he's been out of the side for for a while now due to probably non not probably definitely non cricketing reason how do you see how uh the PCB, ECB and me and Morgan particularly has dealt with that that situation. Well, it's an interesting one. Um, I think, to be honest, credit goes to Owen Morgan and and the ECB for the way they handled it. Um, from what I hear, again, I'm not on the inside anymore, but from what I hear, this was a, a persistent problem um, that Alex has had. Um, and he he was given enough warnings, and unfortunately he, he hasn't managed to clean himself up. So England had to do what was necessary for the greater good of the team. And I, I can imagine that wouldn't have been an easy decision because Alex Hales was a massive part of that four-year plan, as I talked about, going you know going building towards this World Cup. Um, so to to leave a player of that class out would have been very diff- difficult, but. In, a, in, an, in another way, it provided opportunity for someone else. And this is, the, I suppose, the great thing about playing in a country like England is that, you know, we have so many good cricketers out there waiting to take your place. Um, so, you know, it's unfortunate for someone like Alex to miss out on a World Cup. Uh, whether he gets back in that squad, I think, goodness knows, only knows really, Um yeah, it's going to be very difficult because that one-day team looks very, very strong at the moment. And, and what they achieve without him, um, there is case in point to say, well, why change it? Um, so I think, I think, look, the first thing, he's got to work on himself and get himself right and, and playing well again, get himself healthy again. And then I suppose, yeah, look, the, he's still young enough to, to have an international career. Obviously, we talked about a little bit about the World Cup. Uh, it's almost been a year now. How do you think there has been an impact and, and an increase in interest in cricket generally in England after the World Cup win? Has that has it changed a little bit? Um, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, especially amongst the kids. I mean, I started doing some coaching last year, last summer, and I suppose all the talk was about the World Cup and then the Ashes that sort of followed. Um, I think England has always had a fairly healthy um, appetite for cricket. Anyway, um, I don't, I, you know, I don't think that's ever been a since the Ashes of two thousand and five. There's been a massive boom in terms of the interest of kids in into cricket. And I think, you know, I still think that if you look at the county structures, county academies, uh, youth cricket, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's still you still get some very healthy numbers of kids still playing and still still playing uh, cricket to a very very good level so um but yeah i mean obviously when you win a, a major tournament like that it, it, will, it will always go a long way for that next you know keeping that next generation flowing through the game um as as much as we can and i think that's that's obviously the you know our obligation as as former players and, and coaches now is to keep that interest level uh, going and, and, and the legacy of the game going as long as, as long as we can. That's the end of my questions. Thank you very much for your time. No um, problem. Stay safe. Yeah, you Thank too. you very much for. No problem. Stay safe. Love to you and your family. Okay. Thank you. Cheers.